Good evening and welcome to our Bible study here in Ballyclare Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And if you're able to join with us this evening, that's a great joy to us. We trust that you'll know something of the presence and of the blessing of God. We'll seek God's presence now as we turn to him in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, our God in heaven, we turn to you again, empty and unfilled and of ourselves barren and hopeless. But coming to, to one who gives hope, coming to the God who gives grace, coming to the God who reaches out, to the God who gave his son for us. Your word reminds us that without you we can do nothing. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we gather in your holy presence now, that we may know your blessing, that we may know your grace, that we may know your loving kindness, that you would reach out to us, that you would do us good, that you would cause your face to shine upon us. For these are prayers we pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to um, read in the book of Hebrews. We've been looking into Hebrews now for um, probably the best part of some six months. And we've come as far as Hebrews in chapter 10. And we've, we've come into the sort of practical part. The whole of Hebrews is very practical. There's always a, a reason. There's always a therefore but we've come into the, to the second part of the book, which is very directly now practical. And it's to do with coming into the presence of God. It's to do with gathering together. And that's what we're going to be thinking about this evening. So I'm going to read in Hebrews in chapter 10 from verse 19, short reading this evening, and down to verse 25. Hebrews 10, verse 19, and as far as verse 25. Let us hear God's word. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We thank God for the reading of his word. We will come back to that portion, or at least the last two verses, verses 24 and 25, in a few minutes' time. But let's turn to God in prayer. O Lord, our God and our Father, we do gather in your holy presence. We do sense again and afresh, O God, our, our need of you, our need of your grace and mercy, our need of your pardon, our need of your forgiveness, our, our need, O God, of tender dealings, gracious dealings, merciful dealings. Remember us, we pray, as we gather in your holy presence this night. And come, O God, and do us good. We need the blessing of God from on high. And we, we've looked into those early chapters of Genesis and we see all that you wonderfully provided. And we know, Lord, that you not only provided in terms of creation, but that you, you go on to provide day by day in, in, in the wonderful truths of providence and how kind you are. Daily, you load us with benefits. You give us our next breath. You, you feed the little birds, but you feed us. You, you clothe the, the, the skies in, in, in the clouds, and you send the sun and the moon and the, the rain and all these different seasons. And Lord, you, you demonstrate your care day by day by day. Help us, Father in heaven, that we would not be blind to these wonderful truths, but rather, O oh God, that we may recognize how, um, in truth, uh, wonderful and majestic they are, that we may think about the God of providence, that we may be assured in our hearts that the God who clothes the flowers, that the, that the God who feeds the little birds cares much more for us, and all oh, that we may be persuaded of that constant care day by day by day. We do pray that you would remember our family and bless them and do them good. And we crave, Heavenly Father, for um, our family, and especially for little ones, that they would know you, that they would come to know what it means to rest and trust in God. We pray for others, O oh God, who um, they're, they're there, they're part of the family, but they don't know you, and they need salvation. 
and they may be much older in years and um, perhaps they're, they're distant relatives, but we, we crave, Heavenly Father, that you would in some way reach out to them and speak to them. Help us, we pray, as best we can, to play our part and to be a, a witness, to be a testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and where the opportunity arises, O oh God, that we may be able to say something with gentleness, with care, with, with grace, but in, into a forthright way, something for the gospel. Help us, Lord, with every opportunity in life, um, when we're out uh, for a walk, when we're speaking to the neighbours, uh, when we're drawing near, O oh God, to, to friends. Help us, Lord, we pray, to make the most of every opportunity. We thank you for all the young people who come along to our um, youth activities. We want to commend them, each and every one, to you. We want to pray, O oh God, your blessing and grace to be upon them. And we ask you, Heavenly Father, that the lessons that they um, hear from us, and they've heard many lessons over the, the winter months, children's meeting in juniors, in, in seniors, but in Sunday school, Lord, we pray that you would remember all of these activities and that you would bring great glory and honour and praise to your name and to the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We pray tonight for your word. We need the word. We need to feed upon the words of eternal life. So come. Give us the word, we pray. Uh, bring it home to us, O oh God, in all its practicality. Help us to think it through and have dealings with our hearts. Remember our sister congregations who will also meet this evening. And as they meet, O oh God, meet with them and bless them and remember them, we pray. Cause your face then to shine upon us. Reach out to us. Forgive and cleanse us our many sins because we pray to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Hebrews, as we've said many times, is a wonderful book. It's an amazing book. And um, it's a book that speaks uh, greatly of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And it's written in the first uh, instance, really, um, for uh, Christians who had a, a Hebrew background. They had a, a, a Judaistic background. That's where they were, that's what they were bought, born into. But they'd come to saving faith, it would seem, in Jesus Christ. And they started out so well, and we'll come to that um, in the next few weeks. They'd started out so well in their Christian lives, but whatever had happened, was their persecution, was their trouble, was it because of the disregard of their family? Whatever it was, they'd obviously become very unsettled. They'd begun to look back and they'd begun to think again about their Judaistic roots, and they were all for going back. And, and the message of Hebrews is, no, all those things have been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to keep looking to Jesus. And there's been a great deal of emphasis upon the high priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ and his finished and completed sacrifice. The old covenant fulfilled. It was always temporary. It was always with a view to the new. And uh, we don't deal in those outward manifestations of the tabernacle, the temple, and so on. Um, we deal, rather, in, in the reality, in heaven, in glory, in that tabernacle, as it were, on high where God is. Now, much of the book has been practical. It's a very practical thrust um, that runs right through this book and I suppose the immediate import is that the Lord Jesus Christ is that messenger from God. He is the answer. He's the sacrifice that God has sent. And he sits at the Father's right hand. But as we've come then to that sort of turning verse, verse 19 of chapter 10, and that word, therefore, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the, the holiest by the blood of Jesus, we, we've seen now that the, the import is that we draw near to the Lord Jesus Christ. And how privileged that we are to come to God by a new and living way that has been opened for us um, through his flesh, um, through his veil, says the writer book of Hebrews. The veil rent in two, his body rent, as it were, in two. How privileged we are and how responsible we're to be. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now we come this evening to verse 24 and 25 and the trust now is that we consider one another and so the thought is of heaven and of the great privilege that is ours 
but we're to think about the effect that our lives, that um, the way that we answer our responsibilities has on the way that others think about their responsibilities. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Three little headings we're going to use there this evening. Firstly, encourage each other. Think, think. Encourage each other. Treasure, treasure. Encourage each other. Teach, teach. Encourage each other. Think, think about the effect that you're going to have on your fellow believer in terms of the attitude that you have to the means of grace. Encourage each other. Treasure, treasure them. They're precious. They're your brothers and sisters. Treasure them. Think of them as dear and treasure them. Encourage each other. Teach. Bear in mind that the way you handle yourself, even without your words, will say a whole lot about you, about your attitude, and about the importance of the means of grace. Encourage each other. Think. Encourage each other. Treasure encourage each other, teach. Let's begin, encourage each other, think. Now, if we go back to last time, the writer book of Hebrews is urging us that seeing all that is ours in Christ, seeing all that he is and all that he's done for us, how careful we need to be to come to God, to draw to him um, day by day. That's really the thrust, isn't it, of what we've got in verses 19 down to verse uh, 23. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, um, with our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and so on. Um, we're, to, we're to draw near to God. We, we've got every reason to do that. And, and then notice verse 24 and the word and, and, and. Let us consider one another. Um, this, this joining word, but connecting word, but something to notice here. We, we've to draw near to God on the basis of all that's been opened for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've also to remember that word and, that the way that we approach these things is going to have an effect on others. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. And um, so if before the emphasis was on the vertical, when we come to verse 24, there, there's a, a change of thought and it's to the horizontal. And so the, th the thought is keep going, keep enduring, be careful about your walk with God for yourself in the vertical, but for others in the horizontal. Now, we know, let's think about this, we know that, sad to say, church um, can be all about people. And, sad to say, it can be, you know, in a populist day, it, it can be very easily what people want. And it's not, we saw Paul there on um, Sunday evening in, in, two Corinth, in 1 Corinthians, rather, in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11, he's speaking about the communion. And he's saying, well, look, I, I instituted nothing that was not instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. For I received from the Lord, verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And he, what he's saying is, look, I didn't come with novelties. I didn't institute things that came out of my own head. I didn't try and please men. That was going on in Corinth. They turned the Lord's table into really what amounted to sort of a, you know, a holy party, um, effectively. It was uh, a religious bean feast. And they were there eating their food and, and not even thinking about one another in, in doing that. And some were going hungry. They turned it into a, a mere physical meal when it was intended to be a spiritual meal. Now, that happens it's there in the story of um, uh, Aaron, isn't it, and the golden calf. And 
He, he gives them what they want. He gives in to them. He, instead of standing firm and saying, no, this is what God says, he gives in and he pleases people. And sad to say, the church can be all about people, what people want. And it, it becomes all horizontal. That's clearly wrong. And notice that the, the first emphasis here is, of course, vertical. And we need to get that right and we need to keep that right. In a very pressurized day, a very sentimental day, we need to keep that right. The primary emphasis is on the vertical. But there is, as part and party of that really, a, a horizontal. You know, there are fellow believers. And we do have a, a responsibility to think about them um, even in the way that we, we act. It's no use saying, well, it's okay because my heart is all right before God and I'm doing what I'm doing for God, but I'm treading over all sorts of people in, in doing that. That's no good. That, that's clearly not right. You remember how um, Paul would write there in Ephesians in chapter 4. Verse 11, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And Paul's thrust, of course, is that they endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bonds of peace. It's very, very important, he says, and it's very, very important to God. And there is a horizontal dimension. It's very much, um, as, it, as it were, in the shadow of the vertical. Don't, let's get that wrong. But there is a horizontal dimension. And Christians have to think about each other in the way that they do things, that they respond to God. It's a bit like having noisy neighbours, isn't it? I'm sure none of us wants um, noisy neighbours. We have wonderful neighbours, and we're very glad of that. We're very grateful to God for that. Um, I can remember a time when we did have, um, sad to say, very noisy um, neighbours, and it was a problem for a little, a little while. Well, that shows a blatant disregard um, for folk who, who live near to you. You want to be careful for them. If there's going to be something, you know, if there's a birthday party or something going to go on in your house, you, you want to speak to the neighbours and say there's going to be a birthday party, there might be a few cars around, and you'll, you'll speak hopefully and, and you know, uh, talk to them about that. Um, it's a bit like, isn't it, that the same, same sort of disregard. Someone, I saw um, an elderly person there um, on my walk yesterday and driving up the, the road, an, an older lady driving up the road, mobile phone, I saw this person coming and I looked and I thought, well, where is she looking? She was looking down. She was looking down. She was doing the mobile phone. She was down here. Don't know whether she was, I don't know what she was doing, but that she was down here. Now, that's ridiculous, isn't it? Completely ridiculous. You're, you're driving along the road. You're in control of something that's potentially extremely dangerous and you're looking down. It's ridiculous. You've got to think. You should be thinking of your own safety, but you should certainly be thinking about the safety of others. We saw it there again on um, Sunday evening in terms of Paul and his attitude to his work and so on. It's there in 1 Corinthians and in chapter 9. And really the, the, the sum and substance of what Paul is saying there, I'm not going to go through it again, but the sum and substance of what he's saying is, well, look, um, I'm carrying out the work, I'm getting on with the job, but I do think about the effect that it will have on others. And I'm trying to serve them. And so to the weak, I'm weak. To the Jew, I'm as a Jew and so on. I'm, I'm trying to do everything. I'm trying to do my work in such a way that it doesn't negate people, that it doesn't trip people up, but that it helps people. That's very much what we've got here. We're to think about others. And so in terms of the way that you respond um, to the, the call to the means of grace, 
the way that you attend, and I know that's a strange issue at the moment, but hopefully we're back on Sunday morning. That's, that's wonderful. Um, but in terms of the way that you, you know, use the means of grace, that you attend the means of grace, we need to be mindful of the fact that your attendance will have an effect on the attendance of others. They'll watch you. They'll see your response. They'll see your reaction. They'll take their lead to some extent from you. And when we think of that, we need to remember, of course, um, you know, the, the thought that we're a body. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. We're a, a body. We live in a very, um, you know, look out for yourself day. Cain kills his brother. And uh, that question arises, doesn't it? Am I my brother's keeper? And that attitude is very prevalent in the day and age in which we live. But the redeemed people of God, as restored mankind, have a duty to think of each other. We have a duty to, to think in a one another way, in a body way. Uh, and so it's not just about my own walk with God for me. It is about that. We need to think about each other. We need to encourage each other. And a great deal flows, doesn't it, from the way that we carry ourselves. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. And Timothy is told that he needs to be careful with God's word. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Now, Timothy was to be careful with the word. And what effect the word had on his own heart and how that spilt out then in his preaching. But he's to be careful how the word affects his life. And his life teaches others. Notice that we're told here um, in Hebrews in chapter 10 that we're to be thinking. And let us consider, let us be thinking. It's in the present tense. Let's be thinking people. Um, it's there in chapter 3 and verse 1, same word. We read, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, be thinking about the apostle and the high priest of our confession. We're to be thinking. Our minds are to think these things through. The Christian life isn't a matter of just doing. No, we do things in response to God's love. We love him. We said that on Sunday evening. We love him because he first loved us. The word is used in Luke in chapter 20 and verse 23 of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, there are folk trying to trip him up and we read in verse 23, but he perceived their craftiness and said, why do you test me? He perceived. He thought it through. He thought it through. You've heard me say that before. Our Christian lives are to be thought through Christian lies. Someone may say, well, you know, I never thought. I never thought. It never even crossed my mind. They might say, well, you know, it went, it went clear out of my head. Well, the message there this evening is that God expects us to think. And he expects us to think on that vertical plane, but he ex expects us to think too on that horizontal plane. And the point is that um, you know, the, the way that we carry ourselves will have an effect on others. Um, you, you could uh, send someone a, a card, you might be on holiday, you, you might have heard that they've got problems, and you write, thinking of you. God expects us to do that, to think of others. God, God holds us responsible to think, not just of ourselves, but to think about others. Encourage each other, think. But encourage each other, treasure, treasure. And that's what we're being told that we're to do here. We're to treasure each other. We're to treasure the effect that we might have on others. Treasure is the thought. We're to cherish others. 
we talked about um, marriage there on Sunday morning. And when we think of the, the, the vow um, uh, that is there, the promises that are involved in, in marriage, part of that, at least historic, I know people juggle these things um, now to some extent. Anyway, there are certain legal words that have to be said, but um, the, the, they, they juggle words in our day and age. But those historic words, um, you know, you're making a promise to love and to cherish, to love and to cherish, we're um, to do each other good. Two people getting married are promising to do each other good. Not bad, but good, to cherish, to cherish. Living where we do, it's been uh, much quieter in the, the last year of lockdown um, on, on our road, or the, the road that's just over the fence from us, it's been much quieter, but um, historically, um, you, you, you can get uh, Saturday nights, especially other nights sometimes, but Saturday nights when folk are returning from the town and they're worse for wear. You know what I'm talking about. And here are the, the party goers on, on the way home. Sometimes it's from the rugby club and you get um, quite a troop of people and it'll be two o'clock in the morning and there's a lot of noise and so on. Here are the party goers on the way home. They're worse for wear. Their minds are full of themselves. They're not in control of themselves. They're out for their own fun. And they've got no thought for the people that are trying to sleep, for the, for the little children, and mum's got them off, and here they are, woken again. Or older folk who perhaps struggle a little bit to, to, to sleep through the night. And there, there's no thought for these folk. Um, they're not thinking about people who've got to get up and work the next day. And it's utterly selfish, isn't it? It's utterly selfish. The commentator, he puts it like that. He says, he displays the symptoms of selfishness and self-centeredness. Now, in the way that we handle ourselves in church life, we have to think beyond ourselves, is what we're being told. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. And I suppose the essential message is, if you're careless with the means of grace, if you sort of fly the flag that says, oh, well, I'll be there when I want to be there, if you're saying, oh, well, hmm, I'll just do what I want to do, you're sowing the seeds, you're sending the message to others. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The writer of the book of Hebrews is saying just that, that if, if you just cut um, out meeting together, and, and it seems that these people had drawn back, you see, he wants them to realize they're going to have a knock-on effect upon others too. If you're careless for worship, if you're careless for prayer, you're going to have an effect. And you're responsible for that effect. You're going to have to, we'll see this in a minute, you're going to have to give an answer for the effect that you have brought, that you've had. So instead of bad effect, what he's saying is that we're to rightly provoke. Um, and let us, stir, let us consider one another to stir up love and good works. That word um, stir up is only used here and You'll think we're living on, on Sunday here in, in a moment, but it's used here and in Acts in chapter 15. And that's a passage that we addressed on um, Sunday evening in thinking about Paul, um, where we read, then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And you say, well, what's that got to do with this word stir up? Well, you see that word there, the contention, the stirring up became so sharp that they parted one from another they were so stirred up they were so stirred up um, and that's in a negative way there in Acts in chapter 15 but here it's to be in a positive way we're to stir each on each other on for, for good there it's for bad here it, it, it's intended to be good there the provocation was bad but here the provocation is to be good. And so the message, their faithfulness to the public means of grace 
was to be looked at not only from that vertical but from the horizontal in terms of stirring one another up to faithfulness. And I'm sure, you know, many of us have known um, folk in our earlier years in the Christian life, certainly I have, folk whose example, folk whose steadfastness, folk whose grace, folk whose commitment has made an imprint on our own lives. And it can be the case, can't it, that you, you might be able to um, perhaps point to some negative, I don't know, point to some negative things in a person's life, but you're less saying, but oh, he was faithful. I'm telling you, he was there. He was there. What an example he set. How steadfast that man was and it's taught me something it's taught me something which are to look at it in this um, way of stirring one another to faithfulness we're to be faithful we're to pass on faithfulness it would be easy wouldn't it to spout um, you know big words of concern but it's another thing to to to, to rightly provoke folk by faithfulness to be there rain or shine the person who's steady thick you know through thick and thin um, that person actually says something now we're not in hebrews 11 but obviously there's a long list of old testament saints and you know the the, the reason for um you know tweaking those strings as it were is to urge the, these dear folk on in their um, Christian lives. Look at the example of Abraham. Look at the example of Sarah. Look at the example of Moses. Look at Noah. Look how faithful he was. And they're to write, if you like, their own Hebrews 11. They're to be faithful and to write a testimony that others will take note of and that others will follow. And notice the particular concern here for love and good works. There's a concern to stir, but particularly it's love and good works. Love, of course, chief of all the graces. And you remember 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians in chapter 13. Now, um, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. They were to stir love love they were to stir good works obedience to god that's the very design of grace isn't it by grace you're saved says paul writing there in ephesians and in chapter 2 by faith you're saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god not of works lest anyone should boast for we are his workmanship created in christ jesus for good works which god prepared beforehand that we should walk in them the message is that we're not saved by good works. We're saved by grace. We're saved through the instrumentality of trusting in Christ with a faith that isn't even ours. It's granted to us the gift of faith. There's nothing to boast of. But the ultimate design is the outworking of good works, that we live for God, that we honor God, that we please God. And that's here. You see by the example that we set, by our obedience, by our commitment, by our steadfastness, we're to help and to encourage others to be all of that, to be committed, to be steadfast. Notice, it, it's interesting, verse 22. Uh, we, we've got those different words that I've mentioned. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We're to draw near with hope, with hope, with faith. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, verse 23, without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. There's, there's faith, there's hope. And let us consider one another in order to stir up, verse 24, love. So there's faith there. There's hope. There's love. We are to incite one another to love, says the writer of the book of Hebrews. We're to incite one another 
to love. Now, we could obviously delve into the depths of that, but that's not quite where the passage is going, is it? We're to stir up love for God. We're to stir love. Um, Again, says the commentator, not only does love promote fellowship, but fellowship stimulates love. And again, if you're lax, you encourage others to be lax. That is not love to God. Now, we need to think that through. How important to be at the means of grace. We've had these baffling, you know, the anniversary this evening. Um, not quite of a lockdown, but really of a lockdown experience. That Tuesday, it was the 17th St. Patrick's Day last year. And that last prayer meeting when we were together in the prayer meeting room there. But, you know, seeking to put it onto the internet and so on. We've had a whole year of this. I spelled out the numbers there the other night, you know, 27 uh, Sundays when we've only been able to have either something that's streamed or something that's recorded. Of course, all, all the year we've been streaming and recording, so don't forget that. But um, And then 34 Sunday evenings when it's only been streamed or record and recorded. And then there's been so many prayer meetings when we've not really been able to be together. Manage it across the internet through Skype. Thank you for Skype. But, you know, wonderful as that is, it's not the way that we would really want it to be. But the opportunity now to be back at the means of grace. To be back at the means of grace. And we need to grasp the opportunity. Conversation there the other day with a a Christian gentleman I know. And um, he was talking about going back. And um, he made this point very simply very sweetly he said well you you have to exercise faith don't you you have to exercise faith and we do we have to exercise faith and we need to be back at the means of grace and if we say well we've missed we've missed we've missed don't miss you know if the message is being well we've missed we've missed we've missed then don't be missing Make sure that you're there. Let's make a good start back. This is in God's providence fallen out in a a good way for us this evening. Let's be careful with the means of grace. Encourage each other, think. Encourage each other, treasure. But encourage each other, teach. And the writer book of Hebrews is recognizing the power of example in teaching. Now, we've often talked about that in relation to children. And certainly if we have a baptism and there's talk about, you know, parenting and so on, you're going to hear me talk about that. Because, um, you know, before parents speak to their children, that they set an example. And the example is critical. It's not do what I do, uh, do what I say rather because I say it. It's do what I do because I do it. Children learn first and foremost by example. By example. It's interesting, isn't it? When you see little ones, and you know, we've a number obviously in the family, and you hear them uh, picking up language. You hear them beginning to speak, but you hear them picking up language and getting their sentences together and getting their diction. And sometimes, you know, sometimes we find ourselves and Um, you know, one of the little ones will say something and you desperately want to, you don't want to let them down, you don't want to disappoint them to to think that you can't understand what they're saying. You ask um, an older sibling and you say, what what did he say, what did she say? And they'll translate for you, it's amazing, it's absolutely amazing. How do children learn? Do they sit studying a book? Are they listening to a tape? You know how people learn languages from a tape and so on. Um, and I know when I was in school, we had a sort of a machine and um, these pictures, like cartoons, really. And, and I can remember vividly learning French. Well, I know French anyway. Um, from in, in that way, that's when you're, you know, 11, 12, 13. How do little ones learn? They pick it up, don't they? They, they 
they, they, they listen, they follow the example. They learn so much from their parents' example. The writer of the book of Hebrews is saying to us, we don't want to be setting a bad example. We're to rightly provoke. We're to counsel. We're to exhort. We're to beseech one another. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. We're not to be setting a bad example, not forsaking. That would be a bad example, wouldn't it? That word there is the word used by the Lord Jesus. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the extent of the word that we've got there. Or it's the word um, sadly used there in, in, in uh, 2 Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 10, sad. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. No, that's, that's not the word that we want used of us. We're not to forsake. If someone is careless about their attendance at the means of grace, they show an indifference to the value of these things, an indifference in many ways to God, but they show an indifference to the rest of the body. It counsels, it teaches badly. It sets a bad example. A good example given to others is the best and most effectual provocation to love and good work, says the commentator. A good example given to others is the best and most effectual provocation to love and good works. And the reverse is true. And so if you or I set a bad example, well, others are going to learn from that. Sometimes I think we need to think about this, but sometimes we, we wonder where the next generation is going. We need to be careful to set a good example, a good example. We need to be careful to positively exhort, but exhorting one another. Not forsaking, but exhorting. Here's a positive way to exhort this is the, the, the Greek word, um, parakaleo is the, the, the word here. To call, um, that's the kaleo there, para on the front, it means to call alongside, to call alongside, um, to be the comforter, the same word that's used of God the Holy Spirit in uh, John in chapter 14 and 15 and, and 16. He's the paraclete, to pa, you know, parakaleo is the verb that we've got here. Um, God the Holy Spirit comes alongside, he calls alongside, he counsels alongside, he encourages alongside. Our faithfulness to the means of grace brings comfort, brings encouragement, brings help to others. If you're going to be careless, if you're not going to be there, you're going to be involved in stumbling others. You're going to be a disappointment to them. You need to encourage them. Look at that early church. The picture there in Acts and chapter 2. And what do we read? Verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. And they were obviously committed to the means of grace, weren't they? They were together. They, they were there. We're told in verse 42, we looked at it the other month, um, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and prayers. There was a commitment there. A commitment there. Do we want the blessing of Acts? Well, we need the commitment of Acts. We can easily weaken the commitment of others and divide the unity of Christ's church. And all of, this, all of this, says the writer of Hebrews, is to be mindful of the fact that one day the Lord is coming back. He's coming back. He's going to return. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. He's talking about the second coming. He's talking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. This entire reminder, this entire concern 
is to be under the shadow, if you like, positively the shadow of that approaching day. It's the day of Christ's return, the judgment day that is in view. We live um, in a society, in a day and age, where on the one hand people cry out for judgment, they want to see fair play, but they want to live with the idea that there, 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 there is no judgment for them. There is no judgment for them. And that's extended then into the thought, well, people shouldn't be judged for this and that and so on. And we see that in society, don't we? People are allowed to get away with things and everything becomes of no consequence. You can't discipline your children and so on and everything's of no consequence. But God sets before us his judgment. He sets before his children that there is a day. There is a day a day when we're going to have to give an answer, a day when the books are going to be opened, and a day when God's people are going to have to give an answer. This isn't the only place where we find this kind of reasoning. Is First Peter chapter 4, verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. They need to be mindful of the fact that Christ was coming again. It's there in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, he's talking about the end of time, the day of the Lord, and so on. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? The fact that the Lord is coming again ought to stir you up, says the writer book of Hebrews, to walk carefully with God and to set an example to others. Be careful for yourselves and be careful for others, stirred by the knowledge of that day. Now, I'm sure we'll have to come back and um, pluck those strings again, but we'll leave it there for this evening. Dear Christian friend, how careful to be with God on that vertical plane. We need to be with God. We need it for ourselves. But how careful to be with God on that horizontal plane. In the sense that the way that you handle these things, the way that you value and treasure these things, or not, your attitude, the way that you speak about these things, is going to have a knock-on effect on others. You have an obligation to think about them. You have an obligation to treasure them. You have an obligation to teach them. And especially mindful that one day the Lord will return. And we need to be ready for that day. There's going to be a day of answering, a day when the books will be opened. A day when we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. When we'll all have to give an answer. So let's be careful with the means of grace. For ourselves, but for others too. And dear friend, how, how important to draw near to God. I trust that you, you do draw near to God. You don't need great pomp and ceremony very quietly, in a very lonely, private way, you can draw near to God. Draw near to God. We're going to turn to God then in prayer. Let us pray. Our God, our Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for um, even the timing of the word as we think of getting back to some kind of normality in church life. Help us, we pray, to be stirred, but help us to stir one another not in a negative way, but in a positive way. Help us, Heavenly Father, we pray, in our lives to respond well to God and thereby to exhort others to respond well also. Hear our prayer. Grant us your blessing for Jesus' sake. Amen.